current uh, current sanctions in response to Russia's war uh, against Ukraine, and uh, what else can and should be done uh, to make them more efficient and uh, stronger. And my name, uh, my name is Svetlana Taran. I'm a research fellow here at the APC, a European uh, Europe in the World program. And uh, today uh, I'm delighted to uh, welcome our excellent speakers uh, from uh, Ukraine and from uh, Ukrainian experts and EU experts. Uh, uh, who are actually um, all my Ukrainian friends. They are uh, members of Yermak uh, 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 Makfol International Expert uh, Group on Sanctions. And this is a key platform uh, that was uh, initiated by the president of Ukraine. And uh, uh, it is dedicated to developing and generating new ideas uh, of uh, on uh, and provide uh, policy recommendations to our Ukrainian government and also uh, partners from uh, sanctions coalition. Uh, and uh, they already uh, uh, prepared uh, a, a number of publications uh, in uh, uh, with policy recommendations in different areas, uh, uh, such as energy, uh, trade, uh, finance, banking, and so on. And also, um, uh, today, uh, we have with us some members of, of this group, and uh, I'm glad to uh, uh, present to you that uh, Vlad is uh, Vlad Vlasiuk. Uh, he's an advisor to, uh, to the president uh, uh, office uh, of Ukraine and secretary of uh, and coordin actually coordinator of Yermak Makfola International Expert Group on Sanctions. Uh, but uh, he's, he will be uh, he will be joining us in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, next uh, is Timofey Milovanov. Uh, he's a president of Kiev School of Economics, uh, also associate professor of the University of Pittsburgh, and uh, former minister of economic development, trade, and agriculture of Ukraine. Uh, also, we have uh, Natalia Shapoval. Uh, she's a vice president for policy research at uh, Kiev School, uh, uh, School of Economics. Uh, and Ben uh, Hilgenstock, uh, he's a senior ec economist uh, of the Kiev School of Economics. And also online uh, with us is uh, Torbjorn Becker. Uh, he's a director of the, uh, of the Stockholm Institute uh, of Transition Economics um, at uh, Stockholm School of Economics. Uh, and uh, all, and uh, also we have with us today EU policy expert Anna uh, Caprile. Uh, she's a, a policy analyst of the Director General for uh, Parliamentary Research Services. Uh, and I'm very happy that uh, today um, that among our speakers are uh, actually my uh, uh, colleagues from Kiev School of Economics, because uh, I, uh, uh, before the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I uh, uh, was working at Kiev School of Economics as a trade policy uh, expert and was implementing a number of projects on uh, European integration and uh, free trade agreements and DCFTA with the EU. Uh, but uh, after the invasion, uh, uh, Kiev School of Economics was asked to uh, help uh, the Ukrainian government with uh, developing policy recommendations on sanctions. And we all uh, had to uh, learn quickly uh, everything about sanctions and uh, uh, provide uh, recommendations to, uh, to the Ukrainian government. And I, I, I'm happy now that uh, we still uh, continue our cooperation with Kiev School of Economics during my fellowship here at the BC. And uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, and you can, uh, if you are interested in uh, publications and a number of publications that were prepared by, by this group and by Kiev School of Economics, you can visit uh, the uh, page. Uh, uh, there is a web page, yes, and maybe Natalia will mention about this, uh, that uh, uh, all these publications are there, and uh, you may uh, get familiar with them in more detail. 
so let's start our oh, our speaker is uh, uh, here Vlad welcome thank you Uh, good morning. So let's start our discussion. Uh, I'm going to pose some uh, questions to uh, uh, each our speaker, and then uh, we will have a Q&A section. Uh, so please uh, think of your questions already. And uh, for the online uh, audience, please, uh, you can pose your questions already in uh, online uh, in Q&A section. Uh, so uh, please, for, for uh, and <laughs> we uh, I would like to ask uh, our speakers to to make uh, your replies as brief as, as possible, no, up to up to five minutes uh, per reply. Thank you. Uh, so my first question uh, questions will uh, will be to Vlad. Uh, as uh, you are uh, working with the coalition uh, sanctions coalition uh, and coordinating this uh, international expert group on sanctions, uh, how uh, do you see uh, the results of, of the work of uh, sanction coalition so far after uh, 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 more than one uh, year and a half uh, of uh, after Russian invasion and uh, how? And also, uh, how is your policy recommendation that uh, developed by the group uh, is being translated into actions of uh, the Ukrainian government and uh, coalition and sanctions coalition uh, countries? And also, the last question is, uh, what are the current priorities of the Ukrainian government uh, about uh, and ex actually expectations uh, uh, about further, san further sanctions from our partners, including the European Union. Thank you. This is how it works. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Vlad Vlasiuk. Sorry for being late. This is a bit crazy traffic. Um, so yes, indeed, I've been working with the presidential office of Ukraine and we've been doing this kind of sanctions effort uh, for a year and a half as of now. And I mean, the most probably obvious success is, is that we are yet gathering. So today we are having this um, gathering of all the 40 sanction coordinators of the sanction coalition countries. And we are discussing the priorities. We are sharing the results. We are talking about the challenges ahead of us. So we have been taking all the sanctions very seriously. And we do think that the sanctions has made a lot of impact against Russia, against Russian economy, against Russia as the, the battlefield. And it is also one interesting thought to consider it that probably sanctions going to be for years to come, and sanctions are going to be a part to the next global order. And this is very, very serious. Uh, Natalia and Ben, I'm sure, will be more specific about some numbers, uh, trade uh, trends, and some other things about so what were the implications of the sanctions. Uh, what I can say is that not many conversations on the highest political level, including those my president is having, uh, are happening without mentioning sanctions. So sanctions together with the weapons, together with the security guarantees, together with peace formula, has truly become a very important part of the constraints of their global politics so far. And this is something Russia is caring a lot about. Again and again, we're hearing that Russia is either asking for or demanding in their manner to lift some sanctions. Uh, we've been seeing a lot of actions in the, uh, across different legal forums like the courts when some Russians, mostly the oligarchs, are 
trying to have to get rid of the sanctions imposed against them. So this is also a kind of a strong indication that sanctions have its implications. The sanctions is something that people do care about. Um, about the priorities, again, the utmost eventual priority of the sanctions is very simple, to make Russia stop the war. It's that simple. Um, in order to do that, of course, we have to um, deny Russia from money, we have to deny Russia from the Western technologies. Uh, we have put additional pressure on those who are helping Putin to creep his power. So there are different objectives for the sanctions. And if you want to listen to more specific priorities, we've shared this, I guess, four or five page of priorities last week. Uh, but this is kind of very simple. Simply first, the battlefield components, Russia should be denied all the Western technologies to be used in the Russian weapons. This is first. Second is the energy sanctions. Third is financial sanctions. And of course, we would always don't forget about the sanctions against propagandists and the sanctions implementation. Um, this is it. If you wanted me to be short, then I'm short. Thank you very much, uh, Vlad, for being short. Yes, and for uh, for uh, highlighting the uh, the broad pers Ukraine's perspective on sanctions. And, uh, and now I would like to turn to EU perspective, and I uh, would like to ask uh, Anna about uh, uh, so uh, so yes about uh, EU perspective. Ukraine uh, is uh, calls for more and stronger sanctions. Uh, but uh, and better enforcement uh, of sanctions by the EU as well. And uh, so, what uh, in your uh, as your EU expert, uh, what is being discussed now in Brussels uh, about future sanctions policy against Russia's war, and uh, how the European Commission, EU Parliament, and EU member states see the main priorities uh, on sanctions, and is it still enough unity among EU members uh, and solidarity with Ukraine uh, to go further? with the sanction. Thank you. Um, thank you very much and good morning, everybody. Well, it's a big task to represent the EU here, um, knowing that I am a, a policy analyst of the European uh, Research, uh, Parliament Research Center. So, uh, but I will give um, the view that uh, we have uh, published in our latest uh, publications and that an update is coming uh, soon. So first of all, in order to um, be able to look to the future, I will have a very quick overview of the past, of the past 18 months. Um, 18 months in five minutes is a challenge, but uh, I will summarize in three words. Revolution, unity, despite all, and international, but not global. So what, I, what do I mean by these words? Revolution, because what we have seen uh, from the EU perspective has been a sanctions revolution. This is a little bit journalistic uh, label, uh, but I think it encapsulates what the challenge that has been for the EU to approve 11 packages of sanctions in 18 months. Actually, it was almost one per month until the 11th that took a little bit more, and I will elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, revolution because uh, many in many aspects, uh, because of the scale, because of the tempo, but also because of this implied an administrative um, remodelation of the way sanctions were approved and implemented in the EU. Uh, before, sanctions were mainly a CFSP tool. They still are a CFSP tool tool, but the initiative came ma mainly from council and member states. Now the initiative is clearly on the commission side, from the normative uh, side and from the enforcement side, which has taken an enormous prominence in this uh, context. We can elaborate a little bit more on that. Also because of the sectors that were touched upon. Before sanctions were a cheap way of 
not going into deeper actions. These sanctions are not cheap and are not easy. They have touched upon the nerves of the European Union economy. They have touched oil, gas, trade. Um, it, it, they have implied a revolution in other areas, and first and, and, and most energy sector. This has had collateral effects, some good, some a little bit more debatable. Uh, in the first quarter of uh, 2022, the EU reduced the dependency on Russian fo fuel, uh, uh, fossil fuels by 10 points, from 25% to 10%. Nobody, even the most optimistic EU officials, and I think I can count amongst them, thought that this was possible. The same way that nobody believed that 11 packages of sanctions were able to be adopted by unanimity. This, as I said, had collateral effects. One has been the acceleration of the Green Deal, repower Europe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, others, uh, a little bit more debatable, we have had to establish a little bit uncomfortable friendships. And uh, the most obvious example is Azerbaijan in order to diversify the, the, um, the provision of energy. There are weak links still. Uh, liquid uh, natural gas is one, and nuclear energy is another one. We have not been able to reduce dependency on those two, and I'm sure our colleagues have some ideas on how to proceed on that. Unity despite all, the second word, um, I already said a little bit more about uh, a little bit about that, but then how this uh, how this was uh, this was possible? Well, there has been a lot of trade horse uh, trade horsing uh, horse trading, or I don't know how is that. <laughs> um, a lot of uh, negotiations uh, on the table and uh, off the table, uh, especially with the difficult uh, member states like Hungary. Some people were on the list of sanctions and then dropped. Uh, some sectors were on the list like diamonds and then dropped. Um, so it, ha it, it's, it, it has not been easy, but the results are evident. And I think we should be proud of that. The third word, and I am a little bit um, more than five minutes, but just one second. International, yes, but not global. And this will lead to the to the challenges that we are facing. We are in an international sanctions coalition, which accounts for more than um, half of the global GDP. But they are not global by no means. Um, two thirds of the population are in countries that are not applying sanctions, and some of them are even openly um, uh, against sanctions as a policy foreign uh, tool as a foreign policy tool. Um, there, I think we will hear more uh, from our friends how to uh, avoid the uh, damage that sanctions um, have in the, in the global trade. Um, the Black Sea uh, grain deal is, is a very, very uh, good example because there the Russian government is obviously using sanctions in the blackmail. Uh, um, in the blackmail. So this in five minutes is my view on where we are. Um, I think the, the next package will um, deal, drill a little bit uh, deeper into the challenges, which are enforcement and uh, anti-circumvention and alignment. The so-called secondary sanctions, which are not really secondary sanctions. They are anti-circumvention tool that was approved in the 11th package in, in July. It's uh, in June, sorry. It's uh, um, our tool to try to align and combat uh, anti-circumvention. And uh, a lot of ideas were taken from the colleagues at the table. And um, I, I would like to thank them for all the work they are doing. This is a, this is a, a joint um, a joint um, journey. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, uh, I, I join you in your uh, thanks uh, to our colleagues. Uh, and uh, 
indeed Ukraine relies on EU support and uh, we hope that uh, EU will keep its unity and solidarity with Ukraine uh, as long as it takes, uh, as was uh, promised. Uh, so um, it's uh, very important uh, to constantly reflect on the impact of sanctions policy in order to uh, constantly improve uh, this uh, uh, policy and uh, address new challenges and, uh, for example, Russia's circumvention uh, schemes. So I would like to ask question to Timofey. Uh, considering all uh, skepticism about the effectiveness of sanctions, growing evidence of sanctions circumvention by Russia, and uh, even recent calls uh, to relieve some sanctions uh, for Russia in, in order you know, to return Russia uh, into a grain deal. Uh, what uh, would you say to those uh, who claim that uh, uh, sanctions are not working or they are weak or there is no more potential for further new sanctions, that uh, it is very limited what we can do about this. Um, thank you. And is it uh, right uh, right now, is it good time to strengthen, uh, to uh, increase uh, pressure on Putin with uh, sanctions, as, as Ukraine suggests? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, to me, the story of sanctions is the Ukrainian side of the story of sanctions is the story of a bully beating you up and threatening to kill you or partly killing you. And you go to everyone around and, and people say, no, you know, take it easy. Actually, that's what happened in, in 2014. I remember in 2016, 2017, being in Brussels and elsewhere, trying to convince people it's not a civil war. There are documented cases that Russia propaganda has been able to successfully amplify anti-Ukrainian voices or generate anti-Ukrainian voices on social media and in legacy media in 2014, post-annexation Crimea and undermine, complain, ban, and use even technological approaches, basically overwhelm the accounts and suspend them, uh, which were uh, expressing the, the, the Ukrainian position in, in Crimea. In that way, we now have a myth, or maybe it's reality now, I don't know, where people believe that Crimea is pro-Russian, mostly Russian, there has not been any opposition. People, that case is the is documented, it's in an open case actually in a hype machine, New York bestseller um, by uh, an MIT lab on social media. So Russia is relentless in undermining narratives and hijacking our public discourse. They argue that sanctions do not work. I'm an economist and I respond to actions. And the withdrawal from the Black Sea grain deal and the demands that Putin reiterates every time are about sanctions. To me, this is direct evidence that sanctions work. Now, we, of course, have additional evidence, estimates, research, which shows how much the macroeconomic stability was affected, um, how much revenues, you know, 150, for example, billion dollars of revenue has not been received by Russia, 140, 150, as a result of sanctions, uh, embargoes, and price oil cap. We also have evidence or data on how much the war costs for Russia. It's about 150, 160 billion dollars. So, you know, it's on par. Uh, people tend to think about sanctions as if it's some kind of very discreet um, measure that we take the right sanctions and things will be over. Imagine what would happen if we were to think that way about the war, about actually the, the actual active combat operations. 
If only we defend Bakhmut, then that will be it. Had we lost Bakhmut, so it doesn't mean that the, the, the you know Western weapons are not working in Ukraine because Russia has made gains or because in the direction of Tukmak we have not moved as fast as possible. What's the conclusion, you know? Okay, we pushed back Russia last year from Kharkiv. That means Western weapons are working. Uh, we did not push them this year. That means they stopped working. That's the same with sanctions. It's a dynamic environment in which it's 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 a constant constant uh, fighting. You know, uh, we impose sanctions. Russia finds way to circumvent them. We have to identify those ways and shut down the loopholes. And it's going to be dynamic. It's going to be as long as sanctions are in place. Russia will be working on arguing that they don't work blackmailing the West and Ukraine on dropping them. Black, uh, Black Sea Grain deal is one example, but there are others. And uh, finding loopholes and ways to circumvent them. And we need to understand that, and we have to be pushing back. We also have to have a strategy. Of what is it that we're designing sanctions to achieve? And sometimes I think that strategy is a little bit lacking that we're just doing sanctions. But, you know, the war cannot be won in that way where we're saying, oh, you know, we're just going to throw weapons and people at the enemy. And so the war cannot be stopped in the way we throw sanctions at them. So we have to have a strategy. Are we trying to achieve to deny revenues? Of course, if we're trying to deny revenues to finance the war, then we also have to go about new accumulated revenues, pseudo budget revenues, which are kept outside of, of Russia, immobilize them. We're not doing this. You know, grain deal, okay, the good news actually, apparently Russia is bluffing. Two ships have arrived uh, um, to Chernomorks today, and they're going to be, uh, you know, they're going to be getting grain and will be shipped out. But it's extremely costly, of course. So what Russia can do is in increase cost. And, uh, you know, sanctions are complemented by military because better drones, better servants in Black Sea helps to mitigate the withdrawal from the grain deal, right? If Ukraine, together with allies, can protect the ships through the corridors, then, of course, uh, the blackmail is not working. Russia understands force. Anyone who thinks there is a way to negotiate with them and achieve something, you know, could learn from Prigozhin negotiations with Putin. So unfortunately, uh, whatever we want to, 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 to achieve with Russia, it has to be enforceable and it has to be backed up by force, economic, financial, and military. So sanctions do work. It's a dynamic process. We have to be more strategic and more aggressive. And we shouldn't repeat the mistakes of you know, schools, administrations, where parents or kids can complain about bullying. Ukraine is a smaller country on the world arena. We have been exterminated by Russia. And it's a real problem because they will not stop with us. So we all together have to stop Russia. And sanctions are a critical path to deny them A, financing, and deny them B, ability to manufacture weapons. Thank you. Thank you, Timofey. Thank you for your uh, uh, overview and also for your work uh, for Ukraine and that you are staying in Ukraine and uh, you are dedicated to development of Kiev School of Economics uh, and uh, uh, education in U high, higher education in Ukraine during the war time. Thank you. And now we uh, uh, we can go for a little more details into of what are being suggested by uh, what measures, what practical steps are being suggested by international expert group. And uh, I would like uh, to ask Natalia Shapova to uh, summarize all these measures uh, in terms of uh, uh, new sanctions and also uh, better enforcement of the current sanctions. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, basically, we look at uh, 
uh, sanctions as a part of the overall defense of Ukraine. And uh, uh, why it's important is uh, you know, to compare how much we're achieving, because Russian economy is still around you know zero changes, uh, like plus one, minus three, minus five to, to GDP. And for <laughs> Ukraine, we lost uh, uh, one third of the GDP uh, last year. And uh, in order to sustain the war, it's uh, important either, you know, to support much more Ukraine or to have much more effect on Russian economy so that we would be uh, on par economic uh, wise. Uh, and uh, where we are there in terms of effect of sanctions, I think uh, with this uh, specific uh, impact on economy, uh, there is a huge uh, progress. So Russian, for example, trade balance is the lowest since COVID. Their uh, current account surplus, so basically the foreign currencies that they have to purchase all the important uh, technological components uh, from the uh, West, but also from China and other countries, uh, dropped, you know, in, at the beginning of war, it was like quarterly 76 billion, now it's eight, and it's really low for them. Uh, they experience a, a very significant for them budget uh, deficit. So uh, in a sense, this strategy that uh, Anne and my colleagues were describing, they do significantly reduce the available funding for Russia to purchase all kinds of components and to support the economy. Uh, the second important effect that we want from sanctions is the capacity to uh, like support their military complex. Uh, and uh, here uh, we are, I think, the sanction coalition and everyone less successful. So what we see, the critical components and dual use goods, they unfortunately find in their way back to um, uh, Russia. And uh, as before the war, uh, uh, before sanctions were introduced and uh, after they were introduced, the uh, volumes of their imports are uh, pretty the same. So annually, Russia imports like 20 six twenty seven billion um, dollars of all kind of dual use goods and um, we looked uh, with colleagues and uh, with uh, uh, Vlad and partners on uh, what are the specifically critical components that we found on the battlefield and uh, these specific critical components it's like lower it's estimated like three billion a year uh, but they also find their way back uh, to Russia and they still, like last months, the previous months, they are still uh, being important uh, to Russia. Uh, it's very frequently um, US uh, components, intellectual property like Intel, IBM, uh, that can be produced in other countries and they find their way then uh, from China, Hong Kong uh, to Russia, which is very bad like these shaheds and everything we see it from our windows. And this is a huge kind of problem. Uh, it's not that there are no effects on uh, military industrial complex of Russia. There is some, but uh, yeah, it's not enough, absolutely. And this is a big deal. So coming to priorities, uh, it's very critical to uh, continue the uh, energy sanctions. And Ben gonna talk uh, more precisely about it. There is effect of this ex exactly also on the uh, trade and their export revenues, but uh, we see that the effect, you know, started to um, their revenue start start to go uh, up again, uh, and um, the dependence of Russia on some of the Western services is um, going down. So energy is super important, reducing the price cap for oil is very important from our perspective. Uh, then uh, really tackling the uh, trade in dual use goods. And uh, it's uh, super critical. So if uh, I were to stop, that would be the two big things. Uh, what we generally believe in like death and thousand cuts so that it's like all military support, um, the financial support of Ukraine all should go together. Uh, because Russia is a super big country, and uh, uh, it means that there should be other sanctions as well. 
uh, like continued financial sanctions, trade, and Dornberg gonna talk about our idea on this, uh, reducing all kind of dependencies on Russia, like with nuclear, for example, um, and uh, also you know technological sanctions. Uh, we our group proposed uh, designating Russia as state sponsor of terrorism to uh, reduce further their interactions with the uh, world. And uh, we also consider important confiscation of Russian uh, central bank assets uh, because uh, this accountability uh, component of war is super important for, from our perspective uh, to have a chance for Ukraine to recover properly, uh, but also to send a strong signal for future uh, generations of people like Putin that uh, it, it's really not how things should be done. And uh, then um, to restore, you know, some kind of justice that can be restored. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. And uh, you mentioned, and Vlad uh, also mentioned, uh, energy sanctions as being priority for, U for the Ukrainian government and sanctions coalition. And uh, Russia is still uh, very dependent on, on uh, export revenues from energy resources. And uh, uh, unfortunately, as Natalia mentioned, uh, this revenue uh, revenues are still high and uh, that allows uh, Russia to finance its war against Ukraine. So, uh, Ben, uh, my uh, questions for you. Uh, what are the major loopholes and bottlenecks in the current energy sanctions? Uh, what measures do you suggest to improve uh, these sanctions and uh, to make them more impactful and uh, more better enforced? And uh, is there any chance that uh, oil price cap will be reduced and uh, will it have effect uh, uh, taken into account all these uh, circumvention uh, schemes uh, taken by Russia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Solana. Um, so obviously there's uh, much more to this uh, area of uh, energy sanctions than I can talk about in uh, five minutes. But there are a couple of key points that I want to make because energy is ultimately uh, extremely important for Russia in terms of how it acquires foreign currency and also how it finances its budget. So the first point that I want to make is that energy sanctions have indeed had a, a meaningful impact on Russia uh, since they were imposed. Uh, Timofey mentioned this uh, before. We estimate that uh, restrictions on Russian oil exports have cost the country about $100 billion since the start of the full-scale invasion. And then in addition to that, albeit not really a sanction, but Russia's failed weaponization of gas flows to Europe have cost another $40 billion approximately. This is really what is driving the uh, significant change in the external environment that the Russian economy is facing. And it's ultimately also what is behind the continued and ongoing uh, depreciation of the ruble. So that's the good news. Uh, my second point is, is not, so, uh, not so good. Um, the key mechanism through which uh, sanctions on Russian oil function uh, is showing really signs of trouble. And that key mechanism is the discount uh, on Russian oil. So Russian oil uh, uh, is uh, significantly cheaper, has been significantly cheaper since the start of the full-scale invasion and the imposition of the EU embargo and the price cap than, for instance, uh, North Sea uh, Brent. However, uh, this discount is shrinking. It was about uh, $40 per barrel in January. That was the maximum. Now it's about 15 for Urals. And at the same time, global oil prices have uh, been rising due to production cuts from OPEC plus and so forth. What that means is Russia will earn significantly more money from these exports. We estimate that the extra revenues are about uh, 17 billion this year and then 33 next. That's a lot of money. And it will also translate into additional budget revenues. And I should say there as well that the weaker ruble actually helps Russia with budget revenues. And this is something that we've already uh, been seeing. So this really um, puts the effectiveness and the credibility of uh, energy sanctions uh, in question and uh, really uh, should convey a sense of urgency to policymakers to do something about that. And what that is, I will get to in a second. 
But I also want to talk about uh, circumvention and violations. There is pretty compelling evidence that Russia has been selling significant uh, volumes of crude oil uh, in violation of the price cap, especially from uh, Pacific Ocean ports such as Cosmino. We know from trade data that uh, almost all of this oil has been sold above $60 per barrel. And we also know from other data sources that Western ships and Western insurance companies were still participating in these uh, transactions. And we call this attestations fraud because what it likely entails is that the oil traders and brokers are providing uh, falsified price information to these service providers. And this is really uh, a key issue. The second problem is uh, inflated shipping and services costs. So the, the sanctions regime is creating this spread between global prices and prices for Russian oil. And this is a tremendous arbitrage opportunity for anyone who is participating in this. The idea of the sanctions regime is that this arbitrage goes to third country intermediaries, uh, Indian refineries, and so forth. That would be the good outcome. The problem is that we assume that Russia is able to capture quite a bit of this arbitrage. Because when we look at these individual transactions that we see that Russian oil exporters are largely trading with themselves, with their own sub subsidiaries, or with companies that are suspected to have some kind of connection to Russian oil majors. And these also then appear as the uh, sellers of this oil to the final uh, customer, for instance, in India. And that means all these companies have an, uh, an opportunity to uh, siphon off uh, this additional money. And we think that, for instance, in the trade between Russia and India in the first half of the year, this spread between global prices and prices for Russian oil is worth about $7 billion or so even more than that. So it's a tremendous opportunity to siphon off money. And if this money finds its way back to Russia or can be used in any way by Russian companies, that's obviously uh, not in the spirit of the sanctions. Um, these companies that I just talked about are also the ones that we are relying upon to provide the information on uh, pricing. So that's an additional problem because they're ultimately uh, linked to Russia or straight up subsidiaries. So now what should be done? Well, so there are these attestations that are a key element of the price cap regime. Uh, there have to be regular audits of these. Uh, enforcement agencies have to look at these attestations to, uh, to get an idea of at what prices uh, oil was sold and which companies were participating in these transactions. But that's not sufficient because as it's set up right now, the system simply doesn't generate the kind of information that is needed for effective enforcement. So what we propose is uh, significantly stepped up documentary evidence requirements to give enforcement agencies actually access to the information that they need to determine if price cap, uh, cap violations occurred or not. Uh, investigations also need to take place into inflated shipping costs. This is essentially uh, the way that this spread is being sold off. Um, but the spread is much larger than shipping costs, even from the Baltic Sea to India, would justify. And so the remainder is essentially arbitrage that can be captured by someone. Uh, there have to be investigations into the shipping costs. They are supposed to be at commercially reasonable rates, according to the price cap uh, guidelines. Um, and enforcing agencies have to uh, give guidance on what that actually means in practice and at what levels uh, it will trigger some kind of investigation. I said earlier that we're relying on suspicious companies for information on prices, on shipping costs and everything. We propose that, for instance, there could be a white list of trusted uh, traders and brokers in this, uh, in this uh, field of, of oil exports that are permitted to provide us with this kind of information that would make it more reliable. Now also, there is this, um, the, the general mechanism of the price cap is the continued reliance of Russia on Western ships and Western insurance. That's the only segment of the market that we can touch with our sanctions. And we should make sure that this lever remains in place for as long as possible. And we can do that by, for instance, requiring uh, proper insurance coverage for uh, instance, uh, passage through certain territorial waters, such as the Baltic Sea or the Danish Straits. That would make it much harder for Russia to build a truly sanctions-proof fleet of vessels. 
And then finally, as uh, Svetlana mentioned, uh, we do believe that the oil price cap needs to be lowered. There's potential to do that. Uh, Russian production costs for oil are incredibly low. Uh, commercially, it will would remain uh, viable for Russia to produce. And also, we think that Russia really does not have the ability to weaponize oil exports the way it tried to do with gas. And we actually think that it could have a disinflationary uh, effect because the lower the prices that Russia receives for its oil, the more oil it will need to export in order to generate the kind of foreign currency inflows that it needs. So that's kind of my, sorry, eight minute summary of uh, things. Uh, back Thank to you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your detailed explanation. Thank you, Ben. And uh, I have uh, one more question to uh, Thornburn. Uh, uh, about the non-energy uh, export uh, revenues, they are still also high uh, uh, that Russia received from uh, even from EU countries, not uh, uh, talking about other uh, said countries that are not in the sanctions coalition. Uh, so uh, what do you think, uh, um, how do you estimate the potential and chances for new trade sanctions on Russia's non-trade, non non-energy trade, uh, both uh, export and imports by, by the EU and by other coalition partners, taking into account, as was mentioned, that these countries are still uh, rather dependent on some uh, Russian supplies in some industries. Uh, do you think, is it feasible uh, to ask for more trade sanctions uh, from our partners and uh, or uh, should they focus more on enforcement of the current trade sanctions and uh, closing loopholes and uh, circumventions? Thank you. Uh, thank you. These are, of course, very important questions. And, and I think we have to uh, be able to think about all of these things at the same time. It's not going to be either or. We need to basically go with all of the sanctions uh, at the same time. Uh, we all know that sanctions are never 100% efficient regardless of, of what we try to do. It's always going to be like we heard a dynamic game between uh, uh, the sanctions coalition and the responses by Russia and, and potential partners. So my personal view is that we should basically in the sanctions coalition limit trade as far as possible in all of the areas that we can think of, that is then both with exports and imports to and from Russia. So we should tell our companies to not actually trade or invest in Russia at all. We should not have this long list of you can do this, but not that. We should just have a much more simple regime that tells you these are the things that we think are reasonable that you still trade with Russia. Everything else is banned. Uh, some people then say that, why, why do we want to limit what we're exporting to Russia? Because then they spend the money on, on things that may not be part of the war effort. My comment to that is that when you limit uh, our exports to Russia, so we limit their imports, is that this will have spillover effects on the rest of the Russian economy. And it's very important to understand that even an autocratic regime like Russia has a budget constraint. So if we can reduce growth at the macro level, this will have implications on how much money Russia can spend uh, on, on the war effort. It's of course also the moral thing to do. Uh, it's, it should be clear to all of our companies that what is going on uh, between you know, Russia's aggression in Ukraine should be unacceptable to all of us. So we have also a moral obligation, but I think it's really fundamentally important from an economic point of view. Uh, the other thing is that I think we need to talk about companies, how they, they relate to also trying to circumvent sanctions. Um, so we need to have that discussion as part of this. And here we need to think about incentives for these companies. So if you choose to trade with Russia, and you're making money out of that, you should be aware of the fact that we may actually limit how you will trade with us instead. Our economies are probably 25 times the size of the Russian market. 
So do you really want to trade with Russia or do you want to trade with the whole sanctions coalition? And we have to make companies understand that if they are part of circumventing these sanctions, that will have implications for what kind of business they can do in our markets. So we just have to focus on basically these three things. It's our moral obligation. We need to tighten the budget uh, constraint for Russia. And we have to create incentives for the companies uh, that are trading with Russia to not trade with Russia. So these would be sort of my, my key inputs here. Uh, and I'll stop there so we have some time for, for further questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I subscribe uh, to what you have just said uh, as a trade <laughs> expert as well. And uh, we uh, still have uh, 10 minutes for our uh, Q&A sections. Uh, sorry for that we are a bit late. And uh, yeah, we have uh, questions in the audience and also uh, two online questions. So uh, let us uh, first take uh, questions. Yes, please. Um, we will take, I guess, two questions. Uh, we'll reply and then Yes, yes, hello, Pascal and Zenz uh, for Investigate Europe. I have one question. Uh, why critical raw materials from Russia are not banned except coke, uh, coal? And why it is still uh, possible to invest in some mining activities uh, related to critical raw materials currently in Russia? And is it a problem in your view? Thank you. Hi, hi, uh, Jarno Hartikainen, Helsingin Sanomat, Finland. Uh, I guess this is a um, question mostly to Mr. Vlasiuk. Uh, as, as we've seen, uh, sort of surprising resilience that Russian economy has shown against the against the sa sanctions. Do you find your job in convincing like EU member state governments in EU uh, to you know press ahead with san sanctions and, and set new sanctions? Has it got harder? I can start. Uh, it's a very good question. I think, uh, uh, as Thornburn mentioned, we are uh, in one camp here that it should be sanctioned and with uh, a really big proportion of uh, or almost all uh, trade with Russia, Russia is a replaceable trade partner. Uh, but uh, I know there are some examples where it's quite difficult to uh, replace and quite difficult to um, kind of ban this specific material. Uh, it refers to many metals, for example, and uh, ore uh, for these metals, like even take titanium. Russia is a, a big part of the uh, global market, uh, and uh, these metals are very different in the internal structure. And some uh, uh, EU countries, they need this specific uh, uh, com combination of uh, something there. So, But we also looked at uh, like where uh, Russia is, um, where Europe, for example, is not as dependent or uh, US or UK and majority uh, of um, trade codes would be not like this, that there is a huge dependence. I think it's a, a kind of response that I've heard about this is uh, exactly that uh, it's uh, difficult that all sanctions regime work according to blacklists and uh, they can like, countries can enforce only a small proportion of this. Uh, and it's difficult to reorient it into whitelist kind of trade to have bigger categories. Uh, and uh, we hope to <laughs> have more convincing arguments um, that more trades should be sanctioned and uh, where there is dependence on Russia, it should be uh, reduced for the security reasons too. Thank you for the question. Well, in terms of the resilience, I prefer more to talk about the Ukrainian resilience, not about the Russian resilience. Um, in terms of the, is it, has it become harder to me and for their partners to move on or to persuade somebody with the sanctions or not? Um, I think that the issue is about first 
making the priorities and second processing or going or moving on with those steps. I mean, we've introduced already a hell of a lot of sanctions. Uh, it's tons of information, data, arguments, evidence. Uh, a lot of sanctions offices across key partners are now uh, setting even uh, special data units just to process the data. So this is a huge effort. And this is mostly about being able to apply some resources to choose the priorities, not to persuade someone to tell yes or no. I'd like to add to it. So there was a recent case of ban on imports of uh, Russian passenger cars. That's in the news. Poland has just imposed a ban. I think you wrote about it uh, in social media. I copied and expanded and got a uh, hundred more views, times more views than you. So that's how you steal other people's content, which is very unfair. The world is unfair, uh, but it's, uh, I think you, you actually pointed out this very case. Um, the system started to work. So the way, why Poland imposed and Finland and Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia imposed the bans, it's because there is a clarification of the EU about how to treat passengers' cars. And there's a very clear language there saying that duration or whether it's for personal or commercial use, whether it's going to be released or not under some custom procedures is irrelevant. And then they talk about hygiene products, you know, risks are not high, so you can allow products, you know, hygiene products like toothpaste originating from Russia to, to you, you can allow people to travel with toothpaste, but cars, no because the risks are high. And the EU actually uh, cites uh, a high court, a EU high court uh, cases about how the sanctions should be applied. Um, so in that sense, over time, as the bureaucracy, as the rules, as the machine, or as the army of people doing sanctions picks up, certain things become actually easier. Or they just, there is a inertia, there is a dynamic, there is momentum. I think that is happening. And so this is an example of actually isolation, economic and tourist and political isolation of Russia. And I think if we want uh, Russia to stop behaving the way it behaves, we actually have to isolate it. It's, it's not, you know, this, this discussion about, oh, you know, this is critical, this is not critical, you know, what's the, we are all confused, you know, so let's stop being confused, you know, there is a country there which has taken upon itself to create an industrial machine killing hundreds of thousands of their own people and of our people. And the problem is not just Ukraine, it's just they now have this mentality, you know, Putin still has high support in numbers very high, he's still very popular. We can debate the, the tens degrees or something, but it's very, po he's very popular. People cheer behind military successes of Russia. People subscribe and watch the propaganda which says Ukraine doesn't exist, uh, exist in all the genus. And that's a machine, that's a technology Russia now has. Imagine the war ends in Ukraine. What are they gonna do with this machine? How are they going to feed it further? You know, are they going to dismantle it and say, oh, now everything is fine? Or are they going to take over Ukraine? Or they're not, you know, that's not going to end simply. Our job now is to demilitarize Russia because it's a threat to all neighboring countries. And through cyber and political warfare outside of neighboring countries. So in that sense, it has to be isolated. It has to be made clear to everyone that trading or interacting with Russia economically, politically, financially is a no-go. And I think slowly, one sanction, one case at a time, it penetrates the public mentality. So in that sense, I think, yes, it's easier, but it doesn't mean we should give up or relax or say, you know, no, <laughs> like we actually have, because Russia is becoming sneakier too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, two, two more questions and we will uh, uh, end up. Thank you. Amanda, please. Amanda Paul from the EPC. A very quick question. Earlier this year, um, the EU appointed a special envoy for enforcing sanctions, closing loopholes. 
um, and whatnot. How would you evaluate um, his achievements so far? Whichever one of you, I think maybe Ben, but anybody else who wants to chip in as well, Vlad, um, please do it. I mean, very short comments. So first of all, this, uh, I mean, having a single client or single person in charge of doing this sanction implementation, this is very rightful decision. And probably it is just the beginning of the discussion, which would probably potentially include more law enforcement tools to be concentrated on the EU level. And so far, I think that uh, David Dassal and his office has been doing great. Uh, thank you, Vlad. So uh, something I would like to add is obviously this is a very welcome development, but ultimately uh, the EU still has much less experience with sanctions and their implementation than, for example, the United States. And implementation and enforcement is still uh, a member state issue and that in many field makes, uh, makes it very difficult. For instance, when we talk to certain governments and we point out the issues that I talked about earlier about price cap violations, well, then we receive the question, well, so there, there is no company from this particular country X involved. Uh, the good never touched the jurisdiction of this country, so the, the, the country X's customs service isn't really involved, and that makes it really hard to, to implement these sanctions, especially as they get more complex. We have this now very unique uh, approach with the price cap these insurance companies, they are in very specific countries and the rest of the member states can't necessarily do anything and anything about them. So ultimately, and as Vlad said earlier, sanctions are likely to stay with us for a considerable amount of time beyond this particular conflict. Um, the EU will eventually have to also uh, improve on, on enforcement capabilities, but this is obviously not easy to do. And it, there, there's no quick fix that we're going to realize in the next couple of months. But this is ultimately the way this is going. Uh, if this is uh, a European version of OFAC or OFSI or something like that, um, uh, this is ultimately that, that's what will need to happen to, uh, to enforce sanctions properly. Philip? Hello, um, Philip Lausberg from the EPC. Um, I have a question about enforcement because, of course, the big crux is that these functions are not sufficiently enforced. And how do you want to make third countries, especially, let's say, in the global south, countries who are less inclined to 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 support Ukraine or sometimes have uh, are more uh, prone to follow Russian narratives? How do you how do you want to, to convince them to to stop uh, trading with Russia or to 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 not undermine the sanctions? Are there any ways of actually um, not using uh, a stick, but also a carrot method? Is there a way how you can sway them uh, that doesn't just uh, rely on threats, which uh, some of these countries uh, don't take very, um, let's say, positively when they come to the West? Um, yes, maybe I can elaborate a little bit more on the anti-circumvention tool of the 11th package, because Actually, this is exactly designed to, to do that. And the appointment of David O'Sullivan was very much on that, uh, on that, um, with that objective in mind. So uh, the, the ambassador or the envoy, uh, sanctions ambassador, he has been called, um, was especially um, uh, tasked with uh, the foreign aspect of sanctions and going to the countries that are not applying sanctions and uh, trying to uh, to see what is the what is the problem there. So the first um, the first uh, um, account or the first uh, report that he gave to the European Parliament some some months ago was that most of the countries he has been visiting don't want to become a hub for Russian for circumvention of EU sanctions or international sanctions on Russia. So. Uh, if they are given the choice, uh, trade with us or trade with Russia, they would choose us. But the anti-circumvention tool will be a little bit more targeted than just simply applying secondary sanctions. They will first um, uh, implement technical assistance in border um, uh, management trade uh, control. Then 
will apply individual targeted sanctions to the operators that are seen as systematically circumventing the sanctions and only as a last resort will suspend trade in that particular good with that particular country. So it's a very targeted approach and I think is um, on, uh, responding to two, to two uh, constraints. One, as it was said in this uh, debate, the sanctions are there to stay. We have to make sure that they are sustainable. Second, we don't want to uh, give a more food to the, I agree, Russian propaganda that sanctions are bad for the global system. So sanctions can be applied in a smart way. So uh, in that, I think the, 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 the work of uh, David O'Sullivan has been very important. And the army of EU officials, uh, it was said, um, actually is uh, much more, uh, is much more, is much smaller than the US uh, army. But uh, on that, I think the, the commission is also working. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Yeah, it's uh, so. Thank you very much. We have some questions online, but I don't think that we we can uh, maybe a very short uh, answer. What uh, we can respond uh, online. Yeah, first. yeah, yeah. We can respond online or. Uh, but what is the book on the desk in front of Timothy? Yeah. There is a question. <laughs> this is my book. Sorry. Uh, I have to answer. So you know, I I am trying to learn from Vlad. So okay. he he gives me his tweets and he gives me his books. It's it's about a Nazi um, uh, criminal uh, who kind of trying to make his way into the West. So it's a historical book uh, written See, by the second uh, book by Philip Sands. Yeah, that's by Philip Sands. Second, so uh, in Ukrainian. Yeah, uh, yeah, but I couldn't read it overnight, so, you know, <laughs> good pictures. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, dear colleagues and friends, for these uh, insights from Ukraine and from uh, international expert groups. I hope it was uh, useful for, for the audience and uh, come to our uh, other events at EPC. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.